everyone, welcome, yes, to our fourth um, research roundtable workshop. And we were discussing earlier, we're probably on our 10th uh, roundtable workshop and meeting all together, probably maybe even a little more than that. So these have really taken off. First, before we get started, let me hand things over to John Webb, our sponsor. Well, thanks, Dave, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, uh, as the case may be. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we've been uh, very successful uh, with these uh, uh, Zoom meetings that uh, we've been running uh, with our Ivan group. As Dave mentioned, uh, I guess this is number nine or 10. Uh, we started uh, oh, back around April or so. Uh, MR Resources is very, very happy to uh, sponsor these meetings uh, in conjunction, of course, with our co-sponsor, uh, uh, Q1 Instruments, uh, was offering a, a very, very uh, a new and capable line of uh, uh, MR systems. Uh, on the MR resources side, of course, uh, we're still at it after all these years offering uh, refurbished uh, uh, NMR systems, uh, services uh, moving, uh, service contracts and the like. Uh, anyways, uh, Don Bouchard from uh, Q1 is with us. Uh, Don, if maybe you'd uh, give us a, a little update on uh, uh, what's going on with uh, Q1 these days, please. Okay, thank you very much, John. We invite you to know, get to know Q1. Q1 designs and manufactures complete NMR spectrometers from 400 to 600 megahertz with features for routine use in the research laboratory. Want to upgrade an older system? Q1 can retrofit AS and ultra shield magnets with complete upgrades, including automation, for less than you think. Q1 offers NMR instruments with excellent performance at an unbeatable price. Experts know the probe is the key to performance, and Q1 offers smart tune and match probes made by Q1 Tech. Our STM probes have a robust hybrid tuning mechanism, which means faster tuning, unmatched reliability, and improved throughput. Our STM probes have a patented design with tuning that is free from drift and hysteresis for consistent performance, excellent signal and noise, superior solvent suppression, and are made by the renowned Q1 Tech team in Zurich, Switzerland. Q1 Tech is innovated to produce the world's first multi-platform probe, fully integrated into TopSpin and VNMRJ platforms. The Q-Link Ethernet-based interface can be installed on a wide range of consoles to fully automate the operation of older NMR system and add multi-nuclear capability. Q1 Tech also offers custom STM probes up to 600 megahertz, such as this three channel high gamma probe for pharma studies, optimized for tritium observation and providing a wide range of decoupling and correlation experiments. Want to know more about our probes, consoles and complete systems? Contact us for a no risk remote demonstration. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And, uh... Last but not least, I'll uh, ask uh, Krish to uh, give us a little bit of information on uh, upcoming meetings. And uh, right after that, we'll uh, get going with things. Krish, uh, what can you tell us? Thanks, thanks, John. <coughs> good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, I am glad to announce that uh, uh, the next Ivan research topic is on non-uniform sampling by David Romniak. Uh, it's in January. We are taking a break during December, um, but it's January 14th. Uh, keep a lookout on your emails that you will receive similar emails for registration. And following that, uh, in February, the tentatively on the 16th of February, uh, Gary Martin is uh, leading a discussion on adequate sequences. So these are the two next topics that are coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. We have quite a few probably almost until summer, June timeframe, we have topics that are um, getting into place. We will post uh, updates in our website as well as by email. Um, with that, I think I'll hand back to Dave Rice to continue. Okay, thanks, Krish. Uh, why don't we get started? Our timing is the usual for a meeting like this. We're going to have, I think, five presentations from our panelists and which will usually go to just before the next hour. And then after that, we'll turn things over to, uh, to questions directly from, from the uh, squares. And um, 
Before that, though, uh, feel free to put your questions into the chat and the panelists will be uh, monitoring the chat and we'll try to incorporate your answers into their talks. So to get started, then I'll hand things over to David Snyder from William Patterson University, our panel leader. And so to let's get going. Today's uh, panel discussion is on covariance NMR, which is actually a fairly broad field as it's a family of techniques, not just a single technique that apply uh, to small molecule NMR, protein NMR. You can uh, deal with covariance combining multiple kinds of NMR experiments, which is particularly useful in monitoring uh, chemical reactions. You can uh, apply it to liquid state NMR, solid state NMR. It's a whole range and each particular application and each particular variant has its own sort of practical uh, concerns. Our panel draws from a range of practitioners of covariance NMR. I'll be actually introducing, as, as I'm doing right now, the covariance NMR, talking a little bit about the theory and the different varieties of covariance NMR. Then Gary Martin will be discussing uh, covariance NMR from the point of view of uh, small molecule NMR and, uh, and uh, particularly focusing on unsymmetrical and generalized indirect covariance NMR. Dominique uh, Frey will uh, focus on uh, co applying covariance NMR, in particular direct covariance NMR in protein NMR. And uh, Martin Yeager will uh, expand the field of covariance NMR to us, for us into heterocovariance spectroscopy where you can actually combine, use covariance to combine information from NMR experiments with other kinds of spectroscopic experiments such as uh, IR experiments. And you can even use NMR to help guide your interpretation of infrared experiments and similar sorts of uh, kind of cross -co correlations. And we'll end with Olivier Lafon, who will uh, touch upon aspects not only of applying covariance NMR to solids and liquid crystal samples, but also put covariance NMR in the context of a uh, general context of fast NMR methods. In the process of preparing this presentation, actually, I found a uh, review um, written by uh, Carlos Cobas that really is nice and if you're interested from a practical applications oriented perspective of um, getting into covariance NMR, it's a good introduction. And NMR data evaluation, um, let me hide something, uh, review of covariance applications. And it has this nice table illustrating the five main sort of variants of covariance NMR. The key thing, the key tech uh, observation which all these methods share is that they treat NMR spectra as matrices and you can then apply matrix algebra to them. So direct covariance, you're going to actually map the high resolution detected dimension onto an indirect dimension. So that way you get resolution enhancement. Indirect covariance, you're in generalized indirect covariance and unsymmetrical indirect covariance, you're re generally reconstructing experiments that you can't measure experiment, you can't measure directly. You take uh, one or more experiments with higher sensitivity and use it to uh, reconstruct the results of an inherently low sensitivity experiment. And that even applies to doubly indirect covariance. When you're storing a NMR spectrum as uh, on a computer, for example, Remember that it's being stored essentially as a table of numbers. So it's a matrix. So um, behind the scenes, the various software uh, platforms that implement covariance NMR, ranging from the implementation in a, uh, ACD labs and uh, MNOVA to the covariance NMR toolbox that Rafael Buschweiler and I and uh, some of my students wrote, um, all of those uh, behind the scenes uh, computations that in general you don't have to worry too much about, they're actually fairly straightforward because NMR spectra already essentially, if they're 2D NMR spectra, they're stored as matrices. If they're 3D, they're easily reshaped into matrices. So what does direct covariance do? Essentially, in the orientation of the spectrum, these are actually just duplicate images of the same spectrum. 
what you'll do is you'll take an inner indirect an, an inner product. It's called covariance NMR because when you apply it in the mixed time frequency domain, so the indirect dimension is going to be a frequency dimension, it is actually a covariance calculation. But in the time domain, in the fully frequency domain, it's an, it's an inner product. You multiply in this orientation, it's all pairs of columns. You multiply, take the inner product of this column and this column, you get a signal like this. And the point is, right, it's all pairs of columns along the direct dimension for direct covariance. So what you recover is a full resolution spectrum. And you can see this is a, a spectrum acquired with uh, n uh, with uh, 64 point complex points along the indirect dimension. This is the same spectrum of the same sample acquired with 512 points. You can recover the re resolution fully, in fact, and then some with direct covariance. And the critical aspect for, to, for direct covariance is that you can take a matrix score root to suppress artifacts due to uh, resonance overlap leading to uh, false correlations. Indirect covariance is going to be similar, but instead of removing the indirect dimension, you're removing the direct dimension. So you can core, if you have a heteronuclear spectrum, you can create spectra that, for example, correlate carbon uh, nuclei. So the at natural abundance, you can have carbon-carbon uh, correlation spectra at the same resolution, at the same, sorry, sensitivity that you'd uh, acquire uh, a proton carbon correlation spectrum at. And this also applies in doubly indirect covariance and implies an unsymmetrical and generalized indirect covariance. Here's a schema from a uh, uh, um, a book chapter that Gary Martin, myself, and uh, Kira Blinov and uh, Tony Williams wrote, um, where you can apply unsymmetrical indirect covariance, where you essentially just are applying a matrix product, or you can do essentially a generalized singular value decomposition that gives you a, uh, allows you to apply a matrix square root operation to remove uh, certain artifacts. So Gary will talk about this in a little bit more detail. As I mentioned, key to the implementation, it was, as I actually forgot to mention, key to the implementation is the singular value decomposition. So um, the covariance calculations are actually very fast. They would just involve a singular value decomposition of a, of a matrix. It's a polar transformation to be more uh, precise. Um, and it's implemented in software, including MNOVA, ACD Labs, and covariance NMR toolbox in uh, this covariance NMR toolbox that's compatible with MATLAB as well as Octave, which is freely available. And it uh, works with NMR pipe format for files. So hopefully uh, the learning curve is not too high for using covariance NMR. On that note, once we now start talking about some specific examples, I'm going to uh, hand off the presentation to Gary Martin who will talk about uh, covariance NMR in terms of reconstructing high sensitivity uh, spectra for uh, ex versions of experiments that in, if you were to try and collect them directly on uh, natural abundant samples, they'd be fairly low sensitivity and take forever to collect. So Gary. Thanks, David. Um, first of all, thanks to the organizers for inviting me and thank all of you for your kind attention as you're listening to these presentations today. And thanks, David, for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about unsymmetrical indirect covariance and a little bit about generalized indirect covariance. I have a tendency to use them interchangeably. They both give you the same result. Uh, neither of them takes a long amount of time, usually a few seconds on standard laptop to process your data. Try one if you don't like it or if it's noisy, try the other one. And if you need to, take a square root and see if it gives you something that's a little better. Uh, you'll see these things referred to as un unsymmetrical as UIC and GIC occasionally. My interest in this came out of, uh, arose from one of Raphael Bruchweiler's presentations on indirect covariance of an HSQC toxi experiment. And that got me thinking about, let's assume you're looking at an HSQC in a COSY, 
you've got these data in hand for some unknown sample that you're dealing with, and you discover that, well, I've got problems in terms of resonance overlap or something like that. Well, clearly one of the alternatives to that sort of problem would be to go acquire an HSQC toxi spectrum. That's a lower sensitivity experiment, but you've got a COSY and an HSQC in front of you. What happens if you use either generalized or unsymmetrical indirect covariance to combine those two experiments to give you the equivalent of an HSQC COSY to see if you really need to run something like HSQC COSY or HSQC TOXY directly? This is a simple sesquiterpene lactone autumnalide. And in that panel, you've got a two milligram sample of the compound, room temperature three millimeter probe on a 600, 18 millisecond HSQC toxy. That spectrum took 16 hours to acquire. You know, so you're looking at basically an overnight. In contrast, if you take a cozy spectrum and an HSQC, which required just a little over an hour to acquire, you can combine those two. This was done using unsymmetrical indirect covariance. Calculation time was four seconds. Note that we've recovered all of the stuff that's in the real spectrum to the left. And the two correlations that are boxed coming off the exomethylene are really there in the HSQC toxi data, but they're below the threshold of the plot. Both of these plots are done with an identical threshold, and you can see that the correlations in the HSQC COSY calculated spectrum are greater than what they are in the acquired data. And if you take a look at the projections through F1, the top trace is the projection of the, of the covariance data. Signal to noise is 77 to 1. The bottom trace is a projection through the HSQC toxy spectrum with signal to noise of eight to one. So you've got essentially a tenfold improvement in sin signal to noise in your projection. And you're looking at roughly a little over an hour versus 16 hours of spectrometer time. Won't solve all of your problems. You may need to go really acquire the real data, but you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of time to take a quick look and find out whether or not covariance processing can help you. Let's talk a little bit about statistics. We all know that the natural abundance of C13 is 1.13%. From the acquisition of carbon spectra, that's a great advantage. From a sensitivity standpoint, in contrast, if you look at an inadequate experiment, which is carbon detected, it is a real bear to do that experiment without a boatload of sample. 1.1 one, one and 1 inadequate experiments are proton detected, which give you better sensitivity. Statistical probability of two C13s in the same molecule was 1.1% of the 1.1% in the sample that has one C13, or roughly about one molecule out of every 10,000 will have two C13s somewhere in its structure. What happens if you decide, oh, I want to correlate carbon and nitrogen? Uh, life just got a whole lot harder. You're now looking at 1.1% for carbon and 0.37% for N15. So your statistical probability is up to one out of every 27,000 molecules in the tube. Before we go there to that last one though, let's take a look at some other examples. You can combine, as David showed, using direct covariance, homonuclear experiments. You can combine two heteronuclear experiments, both of which correlate to the same heteronucleus, and that's where I started out. And if you take a look at the multiplicity edited HSQC spectrum of strychnine in the top panel on the left, the 1-1 one, one adequate, plain vanilla 1-1 one, one adequate is in the bottom panel on the left. These can be combined using unsymmetrical indirect covariance to give you what we've referred to as an HSQC adequate experiment. This gives you carbon-carbon correlation that's correlations that are diagonally symmetric about the diagonal. It gives you correlations to non-protonated carbons because of the way adequate functions, whereas if you were to use this processing with an HSQC toxy, you don't get any information about the quaternary carbons. One thing that I learned early on is if you think about doing this down the line, it helps to 
have the F1 spectral window the same in both of these experiments. If you look at these diagonally symmetric responses, this is a little bigger presentation. The 23 resonance, for example, is a methylene. The 22 is a vinyl up here in the top of strychnine. You get a diagonally symmetric response. It does carry the multiplicity editing information from the HSQC with it. So you know that the 23 is a methylene. You know that the 22 is a methine or a quaternary carbon. Now, what happens in the case of your non-protonated carbons? They give you diagonally asymmetric responses, as you can see here. They're only on one side of the matrix, so it immediately tells you that this is a quaternary correlation from whatever the protonated carbon was. Finally, and importantly, your processing benefits from the covariance process. Think about 2D NMR in general. You get a significant bump in sensitivity from the operation of the Fourier transform in both frequency domains. The same thing applies when you're doing covariance. One of the advantages is if you're going to do covariance processing, these two panels were both acquired on the same sample. I was using a 60 megahertz opt or 60 hertz optimized 1 1 adequate. The top panel is 2.2 2 hours and 19 minutes worth of data as opposed to 18 and a half hours of data in the bottom panel. Both of these have identical thresholds. If you're going to do covariance processing, it basically gives you an opportunity to cut down on the experiment time for some of these long-term experiments that would be otherwise prohibitive. Here's another example. This one was done using generalized incorrect indirect covariance. And to give you an idea of the difference in signal to noise down here in the lower left corner, you're looking at an HSQC spectrum with signal to noise of 95 to 1. The 1-1 one, one adequate would be 15 to 1. When you combine those two, as I said, you get a significant bump in sensitivity, and the signal to noise on the projection for the HSQC adequate is pushing 200 to 1. And it's, in this particular case, it gives you an opportunity to resolve overlap problems that were difficult otherwise. All right, let's go on to the carbon nitrogen example. What I'm going to look at and show you is a, the combination of an HSQC with multiplicity editing and a proton nitrogen HMBC spectrum. There are the two, the two target spectra that we're going to combine. And when you do the covariance processing, you get this result. There are two nitrogens, the N9 here and the N19 up in the top of the molecule. And you get correlations with multiplicity information. You know, for example, that the 17 methylene, which is here, is correlating to the 19 methyl. When this experiment was, when these data were acquired, it was impossible to do this experiment at natural abundance. It wasn't until 2014 that Steve Cheatham and Eric Skupcha came up with what's now known as the HCN-MBC experiment. We actually did this on strychnine. This was done on a four milligram sample of strychnine and 35 microliters of deuterochloroform using a Brooker 1.7 millimeter triple resonance microcryoprobe. This took us 15 hours to get the data. And to the best of my knowledge, the large bulk of any HN, HCN MBC data that has been reported thus far has been with neat liquid samples with just minimal deuterated solvent added for a lock. I think, I'm not certain of that, but I think this is the only non-liquid sample that's, you know, non-liquid solute that's ever been done this way. Uh, I haven't been in the literature much on this topic lately, so I'm, I may be mistaken. And we need to thank Peter Gareth from Brooker and Coventry for providing the pulse sequence code for this. There's a bunch of references. I'm not going to spend any time going through these. Uh, they're there for the convenience of people dialed in today. Some stuff on HC and NBC if you're not familiar with that. I need to thank a whole bunch of people. Kirill Blinov, Mikhail Leishberg, Nikolai Lern, and Tony Williams got us started on this. 
when we first started with the idea of unsymmetrical indirect covariance, I was sitting in my living room one night nursing a drink, had a, the idea of combining two different heteronuclear experiments, emailed Kirill in Moscow at the time. He emailed me back the next day, here's a patch for the software, do this, do this, do that, plug it in, let me know if it works. So large shout out to him. Uh, Roberto Gill for some collaborative stuff he and I did early on, Bruce Hilton and Pat Irish, uh, ex-colleagues from Shearing Plow, Theodore Pariah from Barcelona, Carlos Cobus and Sante Dominguez, Mark Zell, and last but not least, the guys and gals in the Merck NMR group uh, in Rahway. And thank you for your kind attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. At this point, hey. definitely feel free to uh, ask questions in the chat box and uh, we'll go on to uh, to uh, Dominique Frey, who will uh, present on, uh, will switch, take us from the small molecule world to the protein world. All right, cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. Very um, excited to see what's going on with the discussion later on, too. I'm definitely learning a few tricks. Um, so we are interested in applications of covariance cinema for uh, overcoming challenges in spectral crowding specifically. Our overall challenge is assigning resonances uh, in protein spectra. Uh, and as you'll see, we have to introduce two extra steps other than covariance. We're using covariance to overcome that. I will use one example, which is that of assigning the resonances of sequential imide correlations, okay? And that's the beginning of NMR resonance assignment for protein studies. The goal is to identify on HN correlation map where every residue is represented, which belong to sequential residues. And the way it works, you use pairs of spectra, for example, HNC, HNC, OCA, where every HN is now correlated either to its own C alpha in this example here, or in the complementary experiments, to the C alpha of the previous residue. So if you now look at my little diagram, that means that you're correlating to the same C alpha. So the game is basically to look into those two spectra and find when you have the same C alpha along that dimension here. Because when that's the case, most likely you have sequential residues. Most likely because, of course, you have many residues in the proteins and a lot of them will happen to have the same C alpha. So you repeat the procedure with another carbon, like a carbonyl carbon here, or the C-beta carbon, all right? That's a lot of work. Uh, and in fact, it all relies on the user before doing that analysis, picking all those signals completely the, the right way. And very often when we work with large proteins, and in our labs, we're really interested in studying enzymatic systems, and we don't want to take no for an answer if the protein is large and we have like crowded spectra. So very often we encounter a situation like this, which adds a couple of days just for assigning one single part, because you have to, when you have two residues that overlap in the HN dimension, you have to pair then the carbons here in the right way. Otherwise you're not gonna get the right solution. So that process of identifying which HN resonances are common in those spectra, we're gonna perform through covariance analysis. And the way it works, is we're basically scanning our spectra and using covariance analysis. And so here I'm starting with an empty plane, so you're gonna get an empty plane. That's gonna collapse one dimension, like David explained before, right? And so you get HH correlation by collapsing the C alpha dimension here. So as you scan your spectra, when you find the true C alpha match, then you're gonna create a correlation here. So as you're doing this, what, this, what you're building in effect is from those two 3D experiments, you're making a four dimensional array, which is basically the dream array, because what it is, is that for every HN correlation, you can see an HN HSQC like spectrum that only shows you the correlation of the successor here. So great, but in practice, that didn't work that well. <laughs> this is the, the correlation we want. That will be the sequential residue for this. And these are all the false hits that we have. And the reason for this is that when you do covariance, you're really matching amplitudes in all your data points. These are the slices that David are talking about. 
on the amplitude of the covariance here will be the integral of that part that you see at the bottom here. So what happens is even when you have residues that have slightly different C alpha, you still get a hit. And that's what we're seeing here. So to overcome that, we add one step before applying covariance. And what we're doing is we are using derivatives along this carbon dimensions. And the reason for that is that now we're going to match inflection points. And so when you have a true match, when you have exactly the same C alpha, what happens is that you're still getting all your amplitude, or you get it in the amplitude. When they are getting offset, you have, it, you have interferences now. You have negative contributions that overcome this. So as you can see, it works quite well. We see that most of our artifacts are removed here. If they are negative, we can even take them out. But there's still some true hits here. And that's expected. And it's what I referred to before. It can be that you have two residues that have the same C alpha. So this is the true sequential correlation here. But that guy here happens to have the same C alpha. So you're going to get two correlations here. So then what you do is you do the same thing then in the conventional approach, you turn to other spectra that are now reported in CO with the hope that other residues will have accidentally have the same CO. And so you're never gonna have a residue that has always the same C alpha, the same CO, and the same CB, C beta chemical shift. Well, if, if you have that, then you have to find another solution, obviously. But the advantage with our method is that when you're running our script, what you end up getting at the end is the same dimensions in the output map. It's an HN array of HN planes, right? And so to combine information, instead of looking at all your 3D spectra and figure out what's going on, you just do an element-wise product. That's the second part that we're doing. Because that element-wise product, what it does is that it's gonna uh, uh, only select for the correlation that corresponds to residues that have the same C alpha, on the same CO at the same time. So definitely you get your sequential residue. How does it work in practice? Well, you use your favorite software and you organize it so that you have a display like this, where you see your HN, HSQC like that. And this is the example where I showed there was a problem before where you will have to actually pick, pick all those carbons the right way and see if you're lucky. And here you just click at this position here and you're now presenting and displaying one of those planes. And you can see now that you just see the successor of one and the successor of the other one. And if you synchronize now the dimensions of the original spectra, you can assign also the carbon's uh, chemical shift at the same time that you're doing this. So I don't have time to obviously go through all the applications. They are pretty much like left to your imagination. And we're working on quite a lot of things, including creating correlations that will not be accessible experimentally, very much like what uh, Gary presented before. Um, but I'll end up by uh, shamelessly advertising for two postdoc positions, uh, which by the way, I'm in the middle of interviewing. So I, I got already quite a few people that are nice. So send me an email right away. And forget about trying to make a nice resume. Uh, I want to thank the people like uh, Brad Harden finished the horrible codes that I made that took 40 minutes for processing and changed them into something that runs into 45 seconds. Uh, Aswani wrote a beautiful review that uh, in concepts, uh, 2018, although it's labeled 2017 in some, uh, some searches. Uh, so I invite you to read that if you want to know more. So with that, uh, I'm going to finish here, give back my screen, uh, and we can move to the next person because I believe the discussion takes part uh, later on, right? There's already been a, uh, a question um, about applying GIC and, uh, and or uh, UIC to complex mixtures. Now, what's, uh, the reason why I bring that up, uh, the, the, is I'm not so sure about how many people have applied it. It's, it's actually an interesting direction to go in. But hetero, uh, sort of uh, the idea of having some sort of uh, heterocorrelation when dealing with a complex mixture actually is something that uh, Martin Yeager will touch on when he talks about heterocovariance, where instead of correlating, say, a carbon nucleus and a uh, nitrogen uh, nucleus and the correlation being th through a uh, proton axis, the correlation will be between different types of spectra different modes of, uh, of spectroscopy, and the correlation is through some sort of arbitrary axis, like a sample number 
or time. So, so this is something where people are thinking of within the realm of covariance NMR. And I should probably also put in a plug, I didn't have any uh, particular acknowledgement since I just gave the introduction, but as graduate coordinator for the materials chemistry graduate program at William Patterson, I should probably plug that too. Um, anyway, back to, uh, Mar uh, back to the main panel. Uh, Martin now will be giving his talk on heterocovariance uh, and process analytical technology. So we're going even beyond NMR now, or just NMR. Thank you, David. And well, uh, good evening from my side to all of you, or good day, or, or whatever time zone you may be on. Thanks for the organizers for inviting me to talk as well. And I'm uh, happy to talk about heterocovariance and its application to process analytical technologies. So if you think about correlation spectroscopy, you take any type of data series, as we already heard, um, and in mass spectra are nothing but uh, numbers put in a table. So you got, you got a series of, let's say, one dimensional data, and you correlate them by any type of correlation function. And in case it happened to be a covariance um, transformation, then you will end up with a covariance map. And since we are spectroscopists, you would like to get some sort of meaningful physical information into it. So when your data series consists of time series or frequency series or, or a correlation of both, then uh, covariance will provide you with some sort of uh, spectral type, so a 2D correlation map. And we already heard um, you would normally apply a square root for this type. So, but by Parseval's theorem, they're connected to a, a other type of matrix, which you uh, might call a real and an imaginary matrix. So, um, Isao Noda and his group worked a long time on correlating data, uh, in particular IR data, and since he couldn't get from 1D data nice Fourier transformed two-dimensional spectra, he used covariance to connect a series of data by a perturbation domain, he called it. So the perturbation domain might be a time in the process of a reaction. It might be pressure, it might be temperature, but you need uh, to vary the time systematically and record spectra along that line. In pure notation, in pure matrix notation, you will end up with equations like these, which give you the two type of matrices, um, the real and the imaginary matrix, which Noda called synchronous and asynchronous map. And one, if you use the same type of spectroscopy and you correlate the same type of spectroscopic data, the same type of experiments, you get the HOMO correlation. And if you use different types of um, spectro spectroscopic data, then you would get a heterocorrelation. So with heterocorrelation spectroscopy, you connect or you correlate Raman and NMR data or NIR and uh, NMR data. You could also correlate any other type of uh, spectroscopy with that because in the first place, it's just a mathematical statistical method. Um, Noda found out that the synchronous map, which uh, contains the real data, um, carries correlations that do not, uh, like we would think as NMR spectroscopists, correlate protons and protons or protons and carbons, um, but they correlate signals to each other and when they're in phase um, they appear or disappear together uh, if you use some sort of like a reaction process or if they're anti-phase they would correlate um, 
product in EDUCT, for example. The, the, real, the imaginary or asynchronous map carries the phase information. That means if uh, two signals are correlated in phase, they will appear um, at the same time or they will appear after each other. It's not really clear by the uh, data which one appears first, but this is something you would have to elucidate on a different level. So when you use heterocorrelation spectroscopy, you get one frequency uh, from the NMR and the other frequency or wave number, let's say from Raman or from an NIR spectroscopy. That's something you can see here. So the common domain, the perturbation domain, according to Noda, is the reaction time. So we followed a reaction shown here. I will explain a bit later. So when you apply that to process analytical technologies, then there's some differences to the talks we've heard so far, because my predecessors were looking for the most sensitive and the most uh, resolution. In process analytics, you often use compact spectrometers, which give you a sufficient uh, sensitivity and a sufficient resolution, but not necessarily the best. And maybe they don't uh, allow you to, to record 2D data, but they just let uh, you record series uh, of spectra, let's say along a reaction time, uh, as shown here. And from this data, you need to extract the necessary information you would need on the process. Um, the goals of process analytical technology as understood by authorities like the FDA or the EMA are process understanding and process knowledge to control your process or to optimize your process. Everything in terms of cost reduction is and resource efficiency is advised and the customer of course should be uh, provided with a constant and reliable product quality. So process understanding, process knowledge is uh, a prerequisite for the goals of process analytics. So we followed a condensation, just a simple reaction of isoamyl acetate to, uh, sorry, of isoamyl alcohol to isoamyl uh, acetate. You can see it uh, in a, oh, it's not correct. You can see it in the, on the left-hand side in a round bottom flask with a NIR spectrometer at the bottom and the NMR and the auto sampler uh, in the back. And we monitored in line with NIR and we monitored um, online with NMR spectroscopy. We recorded a, a series of time data as shown here. And since you're all NMR spectroscopists, you would easily see that there are that the water resonance shifts uh, over the whole spectrum because of the acetic acid uh, liberated, then uh, the product appears and the adduct disappears. And some aliphats are not really resolved. In NIR, in NIR spectroscopy, you get some broad bands that you would have expected, and they are very similar and not really uh, attributable for a non-specialist um, when you see it like this. But now comes in the uh, hetero, hetero covariant spectroscopy. And there you can see that there are correlation uh, signals in red, which means in phase and antiphase in blue. And they correlate uh, the first band around uh, 5,200 wave numbers and they correlate it to the product in red and to the um, edact in blue. Whereas the next uh, band at around 5,800 wave numbers is inverse. It has an uh, antiphase correlation to the, uh, to the water and an antiphase correlation to the product such that we can conclude this has to be an edact uh, band. 
So with, with the help of that, you can analyze, or with the help of the information gained, you can analyze the series of spectra you recorded earlier. And you see the uh, increase of the adduct, uh, sorry, the decrease of the adduct and the increase of the product. The water resonance in purple is remaining constant because it's uh, water is already present in the solvents. And by this, you extract the kinetic information on the process. And with that, you could also control the process because if it's getting uh, out of the uh, descriptive kinetics, then you would take countermeasures. And with that, you can also analyze the NIR spectra. You get ADAC and product lines. And uh, of course, this is not quantitative, unlike the NMR because it's not only the amount of sample which uh, plays a role here, but also the oscillator strength of the vibration in the NIR. So that's why that doesn't end up to 100%. So in conclusion, I'd say heterocovariant spectroscopy allows you to transform 1D data into 2D, 2D correlation spectra, which help you in the HOMO nuclear case and or in the homocovariance case but also in the heterocovariant case because in the later one you can correlate data from different spectroscopic techniques and they help you to transfer information from one spectroscopy where you're for example a specialist to the other spectroscopic technique uh, or they can help you um, spread your information in two dimensions get better resolution and see if a band is unique or if a band is a superposition or an interference from several uh, products or EDAs. In process analytical technologies that helps you use compact spectrometers, which allow you usually real-time monitoring, but don't provide you with the best sensitivity and the best um, resolution. It allows the information exchange, or it helps with the information exchange between the spectroscopic techniques, and it adds to your gain uh, of process knowledge. And with that, I'd like uh, to thank uh, some people, people in my group, Robin Legner, who did most of the work, Alexander Wirtz and Lukas Mahler, who just started, longtime uh, co-workers, Melanie Vogt and Joachim Horst, and also a co-worker from the Radboud University, Ruth Aspas, who did a lot of covariant spectroscopy with me when we were colleagues of Gary at Sharing Plow and later Merck. And also a colleague, Christian Meyer from the University of Duisburg-Essen. Some people, some uh, vendors who provided me with uh, help on the spectrometers and some with the samples and uh, some with money. And with that, I would like to thank you again, the audience for your kind attention and uh, be happy to answer questions. Thank you. So our uh, final panelist is Olivier Lafon, who will uh, do two things. One is uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, covariant cinema and covariant spectroscopy in general in the solution state. Uh, Olivier will introduce us to some of what happens if you were talking about li solids or liquid crystals, which have their own concerns. And also, Olivier's presentation will also put covariance in the context of other methods for rapid NMR acquisition. So on that note, Olivier, uh, take it away. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so thank you, David, for this introduction, and thank you to the organizer for uh, so this workshop, I'm pleased to give a talk. So as David mentioned, I will uh, talk about um, the use of covariance for uh, uh, solid state NMR, which is my field of expertise, and also a liquid crystal. So I come from uh, I'm a professor at the University of Lille in France. So we are a quite a large um, uh, center for um, NMR with um, 
uh, with a high field NMR magnet, 800, 900, and soon uh, we will receive uh, next year 1.2 gigahertz. And we are part of French and European infrastructure. Um, so I would like to uh, present you uh, why I want to move to the next slide. Yes. So the usefulness of uh, covariance for uh, solids. So you probably know that multidimensional solid state NMR experiments are useful also for solid to probe connectivity proximities. However, there are specific challenges. In solid, you know, the line are broader, uh, just compares this uh, carbon sorting spectrum of a solid, the same compound, the solid state and solution. You clearly see the difference. Um, this leads also to lower sensitivity. Um, and the line can be non Laurentian, which is an additional challenge. So we wrote a um, review a few years ago with a collaborator, Philippe Lozo, uh, about uh, fast acquisition of um, multidimensional solid state NMR uh, spectra. Uh, so, one way to accelerate the uh, sampling of multidimensional NMR experiment is just to miss some point, but you can do it in a clever way using random sampling. So you uh, keep some point at long indirect evolution time to preserve the resolution, uh, but you, um, and you sample more at the beginning of the FID to um, optimize uh, sensitivity. And by doing so, you accelerate the sampling because you skip some point. Uh, the problem is you cannot use um, the discrete Fourier transform to reconstruct the spectrum and uh, direct covariance can be a way to do this. So we have used uh, direct covariance to reconstruct this um, um, NMR spectra of liquid crystal and solid aqua using non-uniform sampling. Uh, so in covariance, you do the assumptions that the, with direct covariance, you do the assumptions that the spectrum is symmetric. So the first time we combine random sampling and direct covariance for, for the study of this um, molecule, which is dissolved in a chiral liquid crystal, which help to distinguish uh, an antiotopic um, hydrogen site. And uh, you see that using uh, covariance, you can uh, strongly decrease the number of uh, points along the indirect dimension and while preserving the resolution. And uh, this allows you to reduce uh, experimental time by a factor of four approximately in that case compared to uniform sampling and Fourier transform. So we also use uh, covariance to acquire um, double quantum, single quantum, um, homonuclear correlation of um, uniformly labeled protein, uh, uniformly labeled with carbon-13. And you, with this experiment, you can probe the proximity between the carbon. Uh, and the covariance allow you to reduce uh, number of uh, sample points along the indirect dimension. So double quantum, single quantum is not um, symmetric, but using shearing, you can transform it into a symmetric spectra and you can use direct covariance for the reconstruction. Uh, we also used covariance for uh, inorganic materials like um, so a phosphorus, uh, phosphorus homonuclear correlation for aluminophosphate uh, sample. And again, using covariance, you can uh, reduce the number of uh, points without uh, uh, losing in resolution. And also we apply it for uh, acquiring some homonuclear correlation for silicon 29 in a uh, borosilicate gla glass, and we could uh, 
obtain a better resolution to probe proximity between the two silicon-29 um, nuclei. Um, so to summarize about the pros and the cons of direct covariance, an advantage is your F1 dimension has the same resolution as your F2 dimension. So sometimes you improve the resolution. Um, it's also quantitative. Uh, you, but there are some limitation. Um, one major limitation is this reconstruction um, is mainly applicable for symmetric spectra and not applicable for uh, 3D uh, spectra. So I just wanted to mention that we did uh, some, um, we tested other approach for the fast acquisition of solid state and MR spectra and um, spectra of liquid crystals. So we used, uh, for instance, compressed sensing. Um, so in covariance, you reconstruct the spectrum assuming it's symmetrical. In compressed sensing, the assumption is the uh, exact spectrum is the sparsest one. So you minimize basically the norm of the reconstructed spectrum. Uh, the advantage is you can apply this technique for asymmetric spectra, 3D spectra. Um, however, a limitation, it does not work very well if your um, spectrum exhibit broad peak as you can have uh, in the case of solids. But in the case of liquid crystal, it worked quite well, or in the case of solid exhibiting narrow line. And again, we using compressed sensing combined with non-uniform sampling, we were able to reduce the acquisition time by a factor of four with respect to uh, conventional uh, uniform sampling uh, with a Fourier transform. Uh, this was a gain for a deuterium um, uh, 2D experiment in natural abundance in chiral liquid crystal. And finally, a last uh, technique um, we have used is uh, Adamar spectroscopy. So Adamar is not based on the Jenner paradigm. So um, you don't um, sample in the time domain by increasing the delay between uh, two poles in your sequence. What you do is you sample in the frequency domain using frequency selective poles. So um, you apply poles which are um, uh, exciting different um, peak in your spectrum. And the main advantage compared to non-uniform sampling is you can reduce further the experimental time However, there are limitation. It doesn't work if you have a large number of peaks because you have to really manipulate the different uh, spin with the frequency selective poles. And also you use long poles, which uh, lead to sensitivity losses, especially in the solid where the coherence lifetime are shorter than the liquid. Uh, so here I show you some example. We combine this Adamar with a uh, homonuclear correlation for carbon-13 nuclei. So it was for a peptide um, labeled with carbon-13 and we replace the T1 uh, period by a um, series of, uh, and the 90 degree poles by a series of uh, frequency selective pulses. And we could that way reduce by a factor of eight the acquisition time. You see here the number of peaks tend to be relatively large for Adama, but it still works well. Um, yeah, there are about uh, 10 um, peaks. Uh, and Adama is um, so here it can also work for uh, HMQC. So it's a special HMQC because it's through the dipolar coupling because we are in solid, but we probe carbon nitrogen um, proximities and um, because you have a limited number of uh, nitrogen peak in that for this peptide, um, you can uh, 
use Adamar and uh, reduce uh, the acquisition of a 2D spectra from 22 minutes to 30 seconds. And this is especially useful to measure the buildup of the signal as function of the defocusing um, and refocusing delay. Uh, so um, to conclude, I think with the advent of method to enhance the signal like DNP, queroprobe, high magnetic field, and as well as higher field, which lead to larger spectral widths and, uh, and small redundant spectra, sparser spectra. Um, there is a need for uh, alternative uh, sampling in more and more cases. So to finish, I would like to thank uh, my group and especially uh, collaborator uh, Julien Trevos, Jean-Paul Amoureux, and also uh, collaborator in Paris-Saclay University, Philippe Lezo, and in the University of uh, Warsaw, um, Christophe Casimir Zouk, and at Brucker, Eric Scoupche for the help on the Adama spectroscopy. And I thank you for your attention and this institution for funding. So at this point, uh, we can uh, begin our discussion in earnest. Um, and I'm, I'll ask if there are any questions. I have a question for Martin, actually. Um, I, I'm unmuted, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. Um, so I was wondering, like, um, you mentioned synchronous asynchronous spectra, but I, I'm, that got me thinking about synchronicity of monitoring the reaction itself. And maybe my question just reflects that I'm not sure the difference between inline and online. I know about offline versus inline. So do you, are you, are you, um, restricted to monitoring simultaneously with the two techniques your reaction? Or are there methods where you can account for possible delays if you're doing separate preparations and detect, with, detect them with different techniques? Well, at the moment, um, it is very important that you record the, uh, the, the spectra you're, you're using for the covariance transformation it is important that they be recorded at the same time. So when you have a series of uh, 60 spectra each second, then that should also be do, uh, true for the other spectroscopic technique. So th this is uh, important because, I mean, you're, you're basically looking at the, um, at the change of the signal. Uh, I, I think it was you, you, you told us, uh, you're looking at the varying amplitude. So when you, um, w w what's happening is you correlate or the correlation shows you which uh, change of the amplitude happens uh, with respect to the other frequency domain. So when, you're, when, when you record the spectra non-synchronous, your correlation will appear at the wrong time. Principle. There will be an offset, right? Yeah. So did, did someone think, <laughs> I, I love that question. Did, did someone think about putting maybe like an internal standard? Will that make sense? You put something that you know will decay, degrade uh, in your conditions. And therefore you can, with a known quantity, and this one can be used actually for calibrating the offset between your two techniques. Do you know if somebody did that? I could, there's no way I could use, apply your technique to my systems if I don't go offline, so I'm interested in that. No, I'm not, I, I'm not aware about anybody. I mean, most of the people uh, using that uh, have, have something in common with Noda or have, have a combined history. And um, so there's a lot of IR and so a lot of vibration spectroscopy uh, basically used with that uh, and not that much hetero covariance. Um, but there are also, I mean, in, in terms of a standard, so for a reaction time, I don't think that's uh, really necessary because the reaction usually allows you um, 
or a reaction allows you to synchronize via time. But let's say applying pressure or a temperature change, that could be something um, with an, uh, where a standard would be of uh, value. That, that's, that's actually an interesting idea, yeah? Okay, well, it, your stuff is cool, so I'm, I'm, my, my, my brain is ticking about applications here. I let other people speak. I have other questions for everyone. Yeah, I, I, I actually was uh, digesting the significance of, I think it's called the asynchronous uh, map. Uh, which I hadn't really thought of in, uh, this is also to Martin, um, is when you're calculating the async, I think it's called the asynchronous map, if I'm keeping yeah. the terminology right with the node matrix, that X is just a real, is just a real matrix, right? It's a series of spectra. And you're, you're correlating two series of spectra, real, real data, not, a, not complex with the, this uh, fancy, Hilbert type matrix in between, right? That I'm getting that correct? Uh, I'm not sure I, if I got that right, I, I have to say, because I mean, it's not really, I mean, you, the, the Noda, what, what Noda himself calls the Noda matrix, uh, helps you uh, suppress the diagonal peaks, yeah, and uh, gives you correlations at the other end, this is true. And also, I mean, it's, it's a series of spectra, that's true, but I mean, that, that's also true for NMR, right? I mean, a 2D experiment is basically also a series of spectra, yes. very, very parameter, so. Um, yeah, that, that's exactly the direction I'm thinking of, is uh, can we apply this even, uh, something similar even with uh, just uh, standard GIC, for example, or UIC? Uh, yeah, but what would what would be the information? I mean, you, you <laughs> correlate. Let's say you're correlating a, a proton and a proton and a proton and a carbon, or a proton to a carbon. And why why would the pro why would one correlation appear later than the other correlation? I, I'm not quite sure. That's why I'm thinking about. <laughs> But yeah, maybe one should try and see what is uh, what comes out yep. <laughs> and explain later. <laughs> yep. It's one approach. Um, one, one thing that I'm not familiar with, and unless other people have questions, I'll, I'll jump in again, is uh, the is uh, I've not used actually the ACD labs or MNOVA, either of their implementation of covariance. I've used uh, the covariance toolbox, which is pretty straightforward once you're used to dealing with MATLAB or Octave. How do those implement, anybody have experience with those implementations? I've used them both, David. They're, they're pretty much straightforward with the ACD. You just tell the the program, I want to do covariance processing, and it will then ask you, do you want to use one or two spectra? Uh, typically, you start out with the one that you're in, and then shift click on the other one that you want to combine, and then it'll ask you, you know, do you want to do UIC or GIC, and away you go. It's, you know, about as straightforward and simple as it gets. And, you know, the, the MNOVA is pretty much comparable. So, so any other questions? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would have a question, I think either for uh, Olivier or for Dominique. So when you, um, when you use uh, non-uniform sampling and you, I mean, if it linear or something like that, okay. But if it's uh, a non-linear, sampling process and you use covariance transformation instead of um, the, the, the usual reconstruction part. Um, that, does that pay off much in experiment time? Does, so so what, what is the, the gain you usually have? You, you, 
need, need less or a quarter of points or? Yeah, Olivier should answer that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can answer. Yeah, they are, um, it depends mainly on the random sampling, how you choose, you have chosen your random sampling, but um, I would say as a rule of thumb, a yeah, factor of three or four uh, can be gained if the number of uh, a peak is uh, reasonable. It shows that if the spectra is very crowded, uh, it will be um, more difficult to use um, uh, non-uniform sampling. So the, um, the point you can miss in during the time domain sampling are related to the redundancy of your uh, uh, spectrum. So it shows that uh, it's advantage. Here I mentioned a factor of three or four, this is for a 2D, but it shows that if you have a 3D or a 4D uh, spectrum, you gain much more because you gain in uh, every indirect dimension. So it can yeah. be something like a factor of 16 for a 3D. So they are, um, yeah, we, for some experiments, you can use a covariance, it's what we did, but um, it shows that there are other reconstruction methods like uh, uh, MDD, maximum entropy, uh, compressed sensing, to name a few. I've, I've actually been attempting, and the key word here is attempting, to do some uh, theoretical and simulation work regarding uh, when you'd want to, say, use uh, uniform sampling and just truncate your data a lot versus when you want to uh, use non-uniform sampling. And, and I have to say that my, uh, my, I've not gotten anywhere with the, the theory or the computations yet. Um, I, I got a paper out of it, uh, very mathematical, that'll have, I don't think, really much applications in covariance. But it does seem to me that for certain kinds of data, you do have, uh, you say like you, 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 you want to only collect, say, 16 points along your indirect dimension. For certain kinds of data, you get a lot better results doing non-uniform sampling than you would with uniform sampling. But I have a lot of simulations that show the opposite. Actually, with covariance, uniform sampling is the way to go. So I don't quite know how to score my simulations with the actual experimental results. Um, it, I think, in general, if in terms of which reconstruction method to use, I, I've, I don't have too much actual experience again with this. But it seems to me that, to some degree, the which method you want to use would depend on how well your assumptions, uh, the assumptions baked into the method hold. So if, if you're, the target spectra you're trying to reconstruct is actually a maximum entro maximally entropic spectra, then max entropy should work pretty well. But in practice, I know that sometimes I can do a entropy calculation on a full resolution spectrum and it's, the entropy is not all that much maxima, all that high. Um, or low, depending on your sign convention. So uh, in such a case, I'm not sure how well max entropy would work. Covariance seems to work pretty well across a wide variety of, of types of spectra because there aren't so many assumptions baked into it. Just one, one clarification, David, because yeah. I think that, well, Olivier was making a general discussion about yeah. non-uniform sampling because I recognized the uh, descriptions that relies on compressed sensing and amount of information. Yeah. Hence, the sampling factor is like shrinking for each, every dimension. What you mentioned about truncation versus non-uniform sampling, that aspect of your simulation, that was specific for using covariance for the risk of... Yes, factor. that's true. That I was specifically looking at covariance. Um, there, there's, it, even with simulations, you can see with some of the other reconstruction methods, non-uniform sampling works better than uniform sampling across the board. With, with covariance, I think there is some, some, things, some rules of thumb that still need to be developed. Um, but in practice, a lot of what I've seen is covariance seems to do very well with non-uniform sample data. Mm -hmm. 
And oh, just another point, which we didn't get into, is um, some what some uh, researchers are doing is they're actually using techniques other than covariance. They're, they're sampling using non-uniform sampling along the indirect dimension and in, say a 2D spectrum. Um, using another non-covariance reconstruction technique to get that second, the indirect dimension in really high resolution, and then using indirect covariance to get rid of the coupling along the direct dimension to get yeah. it to the shift spectrum. So it's gathered, Morris, or not? Yes. So if I can just make a point, David, um, Maybe I could just show to illustrate uh, the reconstruction we did for uh, covariance with uniform sampling and. Uh, oh, gladly, yes, definitely. That that way, you people see the uh, yes. data. It really shows the strength of non-uniform sampling. Um, so here, here I think we gain with non-uniform sampling because you see if you compare with um, okay. If you just divide by two the number of points, it's rather similar with both uniform sampling and non-uniform sampling. But if you divide by four, you start to see some artifacts with a covariance with uniform sampling. So just the short time, you have some artifacts you don't see here. So I think you, you still, um, have an advantage of using non-uniform sampling, uh, at least in that case, I have not um, made um, extensive um, study, but in that case for this data, um, I think we, we still gain, for instance, here or here it's closer to the real spectrum than uh, with the uniform sampling. Actually, if you if you look at this data again, this really shows the strength of covariance, um, and uh, especially with non-uniform sampling, because even if even if you look with 256 points, just the standard FT spectrum, you can't really distinguish so well between peaks 4A and 4B for whatever that's yeah. worth. Yeah. Um, and and you really no no you gain in resolution with covariance because you can better distinguish this two peak, I agree. So there is a, an interest of covariance just uh, with a, uh, so here in fact, uh, it's like uniform sampling because it's with all the, the point. But uh, so there is a, but also you can use it. I, this is what we wanted to show. You can also use covariance to, for non-uniformly sam uh, sample uh, data points. So I can, this was. What is your sampling factor for your N1? Uh, oops, it, it jumped as I, sp as I spoke. Uh -huh, okay. so, so you had 256 for the first column, etc. Does that mean that uh, there were 256 uh, uh, uniformly sampled points at the top left, but then at the bottom, is it that you have 256 out of a bigger grid? Or is it that you had a sampling factor within the 256 points? Uh, okay, I can uh, reopen it uh, if you want. I apologize, I close it. Uh, no, I was too slow in formulating. Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, okay, so I need uh, even uh, where I. Okay, I don't know. Why I cannot? Uh, uh, so it's here. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know why I don't see it. I will share the screen. Um, okay, so here, this was this. Uh, this. So what was your question? So yeah, I missed. Yeah, so so basically, so if I understand well, right, you're comparing uniformly sampled data, the upper left, uh, uh, actually the whole upper row. But yeah. I'm interested, for example, for the sake of uh, simplification, the bottom one is non-uniformly sampled. Okay? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So my question is, looking at the column 256, 
is it that you took 256 points out of a bigger sampling space for the no 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 in fact this one is, um in fact these two are similar because the, for uh, 256 non uniform uh least sample data and uniformly sample data are similar i i, I think I, I think they are uh, they are very similar yeah so i think we we took all the points so the different oh i see how to read that now okay yeah, yeah so yeah. really 256 is the full grid and then you yeah, yeah. by half and by quarter yeah yeah, yeah. exactly right yeah so the uh the but the bottom left and the one just above are really the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There, there are, of course, is I'm sure you're all aware, many different ways of doing non-uniform sampling. And I'm sure that uh, on the uh, January uh, presentation, they'll, they'll discuss some of the, whether you sample on a grid or truly random points. And it's much easier, of course, to just sample on a grid, but the truly random points uh, have some, uh, there are certain advantages in terms, of, I don't know if there are advantages in covariance, but in certain other reconstruction techniques, there are advantages to really be sampling at random and not sampling on, uh, on good points. Yeah, and certainly for covariance, we don't care at all. So yeah. that's totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, yeah. In, anything from uh, the uh, larger audience? Any other questions? Yeah, everyone can ask questions, not just us. We're the only one who talked, right? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to do like Gary said. We, we're going to pick on somebody who has a black <laughs> dog and just say, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll, I'd like to thank David and uh, all the other panel members for really great uh, discussions. I, I went from uh, nearly zero knowledge of covariance NMR to thinking I know something now. So um, I'm, I appreciate it. Um, John Webb had to uh, leave a little bit early. And so I will thank everyone for him as well. And Krish, could you remind us when the next meeting is in January? See, the next meeting is um, January 14th by um, David Abniak from uh, Bucknell on non-uniform okay. sampling. Okay, great. So we'll be able to get into that more. We should be, uh, we yeah. don't have any, uh, just to remind everyone, we don't have any meeting in December um, for the holidays. Mm -hmm. um, so we, the next one is January. Just look for look for emails, or if you go to Ivan website, you will see the, uh, all the all the information. We will keep updating the website regularly. Yeah. Okay. If there are no more comments, I will conclude the meeting. I don't have a gavel, but no. <laughs> okay. Thank you, well, everyone. Thanks, thanks, thanks Dave. Invite, huh? Yes. Thanks. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. Thank you all. Bye. -bye. It was a pleasure. Yes. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. I actually learned a lot, and I, I hope everyone else did too. <laughs> yep. Yes, I did. did. <laughs> Forced me to catch up again with literature. <laughs> 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 uh, thank you, David, for organizing this. Yeah, awesome. thanks. That went very really well. Yeah. Right. Bye, guys. See you. Bye. Bye. Thanks again, David. And uh, you're Aaron. welcome. Bye.